Welcome to another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio show and podcast featuring your physician host, Dr. Tom McGovern. And Dr. Andrew Mullally, where we and our guests discuss relevant and health-related topics from an authentically Catholic perspective. Dr. Doctor is brought to you in part by the generous underwriting of CMF Curo. Learn more at MyCatholicHealthCare.org and live your Catholic faith in your health care with CMF Curo. Today, our guest will be heard across the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Joining us will be Paul, Dr. Paul Shanick. He's an academic hospitalist. That's a type of bird we haven't encountered before. Yeah. He practices internal medicine and pediatrics, and he trains residents in internal medicine. We're going to learn what a hospitalist does, hospitalist does and how he integrates principles of the Catholic faith to prevent burnout and promote a fulfilling life for residents. So, Andrew, why was it so important for us to land Paul as a guest on Dr. Doctor? Well, we haven't had the hospitalist perspective yet. And um, as as you know, and, and we'll discuss later, this is a big part of medicine now. And uh, it hasn't really always been. But between that and also in his teaching role, I think there's a lot of material that he can he can lend to our listeners. Yeah, and he wrote a, a nice article in the Lineker Quarterly on uh, preventing burnout by following the seven, seven spiritual works of mercy. I, you know, Tom, it, it got me thinking, actually, I don't know if this was your experience, but a lot of my favorite teachers in medical school were Christian, uh, mm -hmm. very serious Christians, a lot of them Catholic. And there was something about, I don't know, I, th I think there's something about people with a deep faith that lends themselves to being very good teachers and mentors. Did you experience that? I, I agree. Whether or not they ever talked about their faith, uh, I realized that this um, geneticist we had that was world famous at the time, I, I wish I'd taken up his offer for us students to come over to his house. I said, I'm just too busy studying. But when I later learned about him, Jaime Gordon, he was Jewish and 100% pro-life and a world famous geneticist, uh, wow. but didn't know that he was pro-life until I interviewed him later for a project I was doing. But it came across, he was one of our favorite instructors first year. So, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's what C.S. Lewis talks about. He talks about the apologetics of secular competence. In other words, sure. when you're really good at what you do as a Christian, it just shines through, even if you never mention the fact that you're a Christian or Jaime Gordon or, you know, a, a believing Jew. Yeah, there's there's something about just taking life seriously and the religious aspect of that, for sure. I, I think it would be something that would be, it's very interesting. I, I'll be interested to hear his experience with residents because while so many people in medicine, I think, would bristle at religious conversations, so to speak, uh, pursuing virtues, understanding the, the picture of reality, these are things that just make you a functional human being. Yes. Definitely a good doctor for sure. Yeah, we shouldn't have people who are against virtue. I mean, <laughs> we're in big trouble then. <laughs> so hospitalists. Yeah, when I went through, when I graduated med school, hospitalists had never been heard of. There was no uh, such thing. But, you know, you laid out a little thing for us, you know, you know, years ago. I don't know how many years ago we want to go. But, you know, a lot of people think, oh, house, house calls. That was ancient, wasn't it? But well, did your dad do that? Uh, you know, I think he just missed the house call age, and he was very much and still practices hospital medicine. But it it did kind of grow, I think, organically. If you think, at least in America, back in the early 1900s, for example, and and we've talked about Osler and other things on the show, um, as medicine was taking itself very seriously, you basically had these general practice doctors. Maybe people would have some level of specialty of a personal interest, but there was no formalized training in specialties. And then you would have these little hospitals grow up and, you know, talking to patients and, and family members, a lot of times these hospitals would grow up just from, okay, there's two or three GPs in this medium-sized town and they've got people that need to be inpatient or supervised right. daily. You know, you had this natural growth of these little hospitals, but now people wouldn't even recognize that because we're... No living in the world mostly of these major big hospital complex, you know, dozens and dozens, hundreds of hospitals in different companies. So so someone like your dad, uh, you know, practicing medicine, say 30 or 40 years ago, would, you know, first go to the hospital, right? Every morning and maybe even later in the afternoon. And there'd be multiple hospitals. And in between that, you're seeing patients in the office. 
Oh yeah. And, and it's so funny because he still does. We, we talk about this a little bit because yeah, every day he, we, we clocked at one time and he definitely drives over a hundred miles a day because they have a, a rural practice. And so you start the morning in the hospital, then you go to office and uh, in between dropping kids off at school and what, what not else. Um, but that is something that has quickly, especially in metropolitan areas, been passing away in favor of the hospitalist system. So that doctors like you don't have to go to the hospital anymore. So what's the, the good and the bad in your life of that? Yeah, it's it's bittersweet because there for a lot of people who did hospital medicine for me, you know, briefly, I guess, five years or something, I've only been a doctor for 10 years. So I'm still new at this comparatively. Um, it, it's bittersweet because there's a lot about what what I always thought and what many people feel about being a doctor, a lot of that work occurs in the hospital and nowhere else. And so you do give up a lot of skills that you had to really work hard to learn mm -hmm. and um, opportunities to be with patients when they appreciate it the most, when they're the sickest. Um, but there's a lot of challenges too with hospital, you know, hospital medicine for somebody who's not a pure hospitalist. One of the things I ran into uh, before I had any partners was I couldn't really get call coverage. You know, Oof. basically when when you practice hospital medicine, you have to be within 20 minutes of the hospital at all times is usually the, the bylaws. And uh, if you want to leave town, if you don't have family locally, you want to go to grandma's house for Thanksgiving, you're supposed to get call coverage, that type of thing. And uh, it used to be easier when you have everybody doing this, we would share and share alike. As that number has shrunk, it was, I found it impossible to get call coverage. And, um, and the hospitals really, I think, prefer the hospitalists because they are so much more efficient. They're already there. You know, they're going through the patients. They might see, we'll, we'll have to ask our guests today, but I know many hospitalists will see even 30 or more patients a day. Wow. And so it's very, very much, I, I think, the cadence of an outpatient practice. But, uh, you know, when, when I would go and when I think family doctors would go to the hospital or internists, you know that patient and you know their history and you get yes. to help them. And so it's it's a joy, but also a big burden. Well, the hospitalist, yeah, just does medicine in the hospital, takes care of hospitalized patients. We're going to talk to Paul Shenick about that after our break. But before the break, we've got our medical trivia question of the day. And the category is the rise of the hospitalist. So the question, in 1996, the field of hospitalist medicine was founded. And by three years later, in 1999, there were 1,000 to 2,000 hospitalists in the U.S. And at that time, so this is 24 years ago, they estimated that there would be a need of 19,000 hospitalists that would fulfill all needs for hospitalists. What is the actual number of employed hospitalists as of 2019, remember their estimate 20 years before that was 19,000. Multiple choice. Is it A, 4,000, B, 9,000, C, the 19,000 they predicted, D, 29,000, or E, 44,000 hospitalists? We'll have the answer at the end of the show, but after the break, Paul Shanick on an academic hospitalist lifestyle. Welcome back to Dr. Doctor. We have with us Paul Shanick from Cleveland, Ohio. And Paul is a graduate of The Ohio State University School of Medicine. He now practices internal medicine and pediatrics and works as a hospitalist in the acute care medicine group at Lewis Stokes Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio. He also has an academic appointment as assistant professor of medicine and pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. And he's the associate program director for internal medicine residents at University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center in Cleveland Veterans Affairs. Paul, welcome to Dr. Doctor. Yeah, thanks, Tom and Andrew. Good to see you both. Um, thanks for having me. All right. I can't remember when I met this strange uh, push me, pull you wildebeest thing of an internal medicine pediatric specialist, but <laughs> it sounded like taking two specialties with somebody who couldn't decide on which they'd rather do. They put it together. It's like family practice without OBGYN, but they made it longer. So how does that all work? <laughs> so, someone told me it's because your parents didn't hug you when you were little, and that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my parents hugged me a lot, but, um, you know, I think uh, I... I really thought about being a general practitioner of some sort, right? I wanted to stay general. Um, I thought about family practice. I thought about general internal medicine. 
Um, but I really didn't want to give up the pediatrics. And as I worked at Ohio State where I went to medical school, there were so many great residents who were in the med peds program there that I just kept working with them and was really attracted to the type of the way that they process problems, the way that they approached the whole patient. And um, for me, as I kind of leaned for, away from the outpatient world towards the inpatient world, it became a much better fit for me. And, and it certainly was a great journey. Because MedPeds also, there's the, one of the big advantages too, is you can subspecialize if you ever wanted to, right? Right. Whereas in family medicine, it's kind of like you're you're on the general track for life, but it's a year longer. And it so is. it's, <laughs> you know, pro, pros and cons. What what kind of training did you get to do to be both internist and pediatrician? Yeah. So it's, it's essentially a compressed version of both internal medicine and pediatric residencies. So my training, I basically switched back and forth every three months for four years. So I would be a peds resident and then I would be a medicine resident. And, I'd be, and so the program was sort of a program within two programs. And so we had like our little med peds family uh-huh. and we would like they split the class and we would half of us would be on peds, half of us would be on medicine. And so essentially I got the same sort of training, you know, inpatient and outpatient, ICU, elective, subspecialty for each of those two specialties. And uh, like, like you said, Andrew, you, you can specialize at, after training. You can do outpatient you know, primary care if you want, um, and, but I definitely tilted more towards the inpatient side. That's where I ended up being happier. So are you board certified in both specialties? I am. Yes. Yeah. Double, double boarded. Yeah. So that's, that's why you could do a, you could do peds cardiology or adult cardiology if you wanted to. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Many med peds doctors find, many med peds doctors find like a niche, you know, cystic fibrosis is a classic one, you know, where it's a pediatric illness, but because of advances in treating the disease, the patients may survive to adulthood now. And so a med peds doctor, that's sort of a a, a typical med peds doctor, like a classic story. Um, you know, a, a disease process where the children transition from a pediatric to adult and develop new problems. So do most of them work outpatient? Do most work inpatient or is it a, a mix? Oh, it, it's a mix. It's a, it really depends on, I, I think in some respects, the uh, indecisiveness is kind of a little joke, but it, it is a little bit true is that you do push back your decision a little bit later. And so some people in med peds are indecisive. Some people have a very specific goal like cystic fibrosis. Um, and some just really want to get that broad training, which that's what I tell myself I did it. I don't think it was because I was indecisive, <laughs> but it, it may have been because I was indecisive. Are, are you sure? I'm not. <laughs> that, <yeah. laughs> so what was the attraction to doing all inpatient medicine for you? Right. I mean, so for me, you know, I would do all these rotations during residency. I did all sorts of rotations. And and again, I viewed myself as someone that was going to be a, a, a primary care doctor. But I found that I had the most joy in the hospital when I was the senior resident. So I, Andrew remembers this, I'm sure, from his residency. Just the time when I was leading a team in the hospital was my favorite time in the hospital. It was uh, there were, The interactions you had with the patients were so powerful. You had to get them to trust you when they don't know you, you have to, there's so many problems that are, occur. There's so many ways to help patients and you have to understand how to help your patient navigate this complex system. And that's really what I felt drawn to. And, and that's what I really, you know, that's, that's why it took me about three years to not be indecisive on it, but I, I ended up choosing hospital medicine and I've been thrilled with that career choice. And Teaching is kind of cooked in a lot of times Correct. in hospital medicine, right? Mm-hmm. So when t- describe for people who haven't experienced this, what does that team look like that, mm-hmm. that you would be leading as a chief resident or now as a, as a hospitalist? Sure. Yeah. So a, a typical team, and I do work on these now as a, as a hospitalist, um, is you, know, you have the attending physician who's in charge of the team, and they're usually an employee of the hospital. You have the senior resident who's usually a second, third, or fourth year resident who is um, sort of managing the, I call them like my second in command, or I, I, since I work at the VA, so you know, it's my second in command, or it's my, you know, they're in charge when I'm not here. And the senior resident's really there to coordinate everything, making sure that there's teaching involved, that the trainees are doing a good job, that the work is getting done. Then there's the interns, which the interns are first year doctors right out of residency. And in most programs, they tend to be sort of the workforce. They're put, yeah, they're, I'm sorry, medical school, yes. So they're they're putting in the orders, they're putting in the they're talking to the nurses, they're doing a lot of the work with the support of that structure. And then many teams have 
upper level medical students as well, you know, third or fourth year medical students doing their rotations on internal medicine or pediatric, you know, so that's a typical quote unquote teaching team. I, I always thought it was a powerful image when I got to be part of those in, in various stages where you'd be going through the hallway, you know, kind of room oh, yeah. to room. And then this poor patient's been waiting there, whatever their problem is, they've been sitting around for 23 and hours and 45 minutes, and then boom, <laughs> Yeah. Everybody's here, yep. and we're doing stuff right now. Yep. And so uh, it it's an experience. I think that would be – it sounds like you really enjoy that. It sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so can you describe how this field grew from nothing? So 30 years ago, there wasn't this field. Now there is. What happened? Yeah, so my understanding of the history is that this really grew from a change in the old you know, general practitioner model where – you know, which is what I – you know, was understanding to be like what it is to be a doctor. You, you're you an outpatient doctor, you have your practice. If your patients get admitted to the hospital, you take care of them while you're in your clinic. And I actually worked with some doctors who still practice that way, even in the, you know, the, the 20 teens when I was training. Um, but I think, and, you know, certainly Andrew can speak to this, the challenges of an outpatient practice now are like incredible. I mean, the administrative burden, the, um, you know, documentation burden. I think a lot of physicians found it to be really challenging to continue to do all that well while taking care of their patients in the hospital. And then simultaneously, the patients in the hospital have become more complex. I, I looked at a paper, it was a poster uh, uh, a few years ago that talked about the case mix index, which is a number we use to say how sick or complicated our patients are in the hospital. And that has continued to rise over the past few decades. So patients in the hospital are sicker the doctors are busier and there came this need to almost find specialists for the inpatient world. You know, the idea that we need someone who can do just this, you know, and, and communicate with the primary care doctor, but it can't be that one person can't do this two jobs anymore. Could, could you maybe describe a little bit of what your average day looks like when sure. you hit the, hit the ground running? Yeah. So, I mean, I usually come in, you know, depending on senses around 7.30, um, rounds are at 8 in the morning. You know, oftentimes I do have the electronic health record on my computer, so I may log in early to check the list, make sure that labs are coming back. And um, so I come in at 8 o'clock, and that's when we have our rounds. So rounds usually are about two to three hours. We talk about all of the patients. We do what you described, Andrew, where we just kind of go as like a team and we go see all of our patients. And that's where I think the bulk of the teaching happens. You know, we talk about, you know, this patient has COPD. Why are they, why is their oxygen low if you have COPD? And we, we have these like discussions about um, pathophysiology and um, how to think through patients' problems. After that, you know, the residents are still doing that day-to-day -day work right there. And if I were a solo hospitalist without a teaching component, I would be doing that work as well, which is talking to nurses, putting in orders, making sure that the patients are being discharged, taking care of new patients as they come in the hospital. But what I do as a teaching physician is I'm supervising. So active supervision usually involves, for me, a, a heavy dose of chart review where I'm looking up these patients, I'm coming up with why are they here? What do I need to do for them? Um, I may be talking to the primary care doctor. I may send them a message through the VA secure message system or, or reading a note about, um, you know, what their backstory is. And then I'm trying to get a sense of the big picture. So that's like the afternoon for me is, is a lot of chart review, writing notes, coordinating care, um, troubleshooting systems issues. I know how to work at the VA and the, re the, the residents do not, right? So... I know how to get my patient home oxygen, my residents may not, right? And so that's, you know, troubleshooting issues as they arrive. And usually I leave around like five or six. And then many times though, I am logging on at home while I'm on service, um, you know, after the kids are in bed um, to do like some extra, you know, chart review or, or notes, making sure things are getting done. Um, and that usually goes on for about one or two weeks at a time. So how many patients will you have at a time? It varies. It varies per hospital. For me personally, it's usually somewhere between 12 and 12 and 16, um, which is pretty light amongst uh, other places. Other facilities will be closer to 16 to 20. It, it probably has a lot to do with the teaching too, because mm -hmm. 
it uh, as cool as it is to have people help you, it actually takes a lot more time to round, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, it takes takes time to round. It takes time to supervise. And as I mentioned, you know, I, I, I've worked at the VA now for six years. I know the system pretty well. The residents are new every two weeks, right? So it would be faster in a lot of ways if I were taking care of the patients myself, but that's not what this is about. It's about taking care of patients safely while teaching them and making sure that the training has, is happening. And that's the- Every the two description. weeks, not every yeah. four weeks. Not It's every two weeks now. It used to be every four, but it's they switch every two weeks. And so it's- it's a grind to get them uh, um, up to speed. You get one group up to speed and then I'm on service, you know, a month later and it's a totally new group and you got to get them up to speed. So you need to practice the virtue of patience and uh, some of the, the virtues that we'll talk about later, you know, come into play because it's, you're doing the same thing over and over again a lot. Um, it, it, one, it's one of the things that I, I always thought was really enticing about hospitalist mm -hmm. work, or at least on the other side, we always, you know, the grass is greener. The The schedule is such that you get uh, more blocks of time off. Is that right? That's correct. So, I mean, it depends. My job's a little different now uh, because I do have some like formal academic work that I do. But a typical day will be, I'll be on service, which is what I just described, usually for one or two weeks at right. a time. And that's usually followed by a time off service where you have, you know, days off in the middle of the week. Um, the the classic model, which is not always followed anymore, is a hospitalist will work for seven days in a row and then have the next seven days off. I haven't had that in a long time, but that's a typical model. So I think the hospital medicine definitely has ebbs and flows, though, and that was attractive to me. You know, I'll be, I was on service last week. I worked seven days in a row. This week I'm off service, you know, I have Martin Luther King Day off and I have now, you know, I'm catching up on administrative and teaching work this week. So it's a lighter week for me. Does that make sense? Yes. It, a question I have is when you're doing outpatient medicine, especially primary care like you are, uh, you get to know your patients. But in hospitalist medicine, it seems like you don't have as much continuity of care. How do you overcome that? Or is there continuity? So I tell people actually that this is one of the biggest challenges of hospital medicine. And in some ways to me, it's the thing I like best about hospital medicine. Not that I, I, I would love to have continuity, but for me, there's such a challenge and like, you know, to really get a patient to trust you quickly. You know, I have to walk, I, me going to work is somebody's worst day of their life, right? I mean, we all talk about any of our family members get hospitalized. That's one of their worst days of their life. And for me, I'm coming to work. And so I have to come in, come in, get them to trust me. They don't know me and, you know, bringing my faith into it or bringing just like the, the values that our faith teaches about how to, you know, think about other people. To me, that's a, that's a real challenge and something I relish. Like, how can I get this person to really trust me? Because we got to make big decisions together and they're really sick. And so that's something I really value about the field and it's something I really love about it. What gives you, is that what gives you the greatest joy in it? Is there something else that gives you the, the most joy? You know, you said teaching, you know, heading a team, that's fun. Getting the patient to trust you. Is there anything else? I mean, I, I do like the complexity of medical problems. Like I've always been drawn to puzzles and, you know, patients, especially in internal medicine have, you have to figure things out a lot. You have to think through like, what's my differential diagnosis, right? That, that phrase of right. what are the three, four or five things that could be wrong with this patient because they have X, Y, and Z wrong with them. How do I like come up with a way to represent those problems that I can make sense of and tell somebody else about it? And that's usually one of the things I really like about it is when I have a complex patient who's sick and I need to try to figure them out quickly. That's also a lot of, that's a source of joy for sure. To tell us, you know, and, and for our listeners too, who are kind of maybe looking in from outside the medical field, tell us about the relationship with the primary care physician. And sure. and maybe you can give me some pointers how to do a better job communicating with hospitalists that I get to work with. Sure. I mean, go, this is a, a an important thing to talk about. I mean, so first off, there is the Every hospitalist who is ready to send a patient home has to write something called a discharge summary. And this is ideally, and, and Andrew, you can critique my colleagues on these, like this is ideally a short, succinct document that says the patient had pneumonia. We treated him. He got better, but we found <laughs> there might be a tumor on his lungs. Please address that. You know, like that's ideally what, you know, a 
um, a discharge summary is. So I think I try to do a very good job of making my discharge summaries consinct and having bullet points for a very busy primary care doctor. Um, I do work at the VA, which is a, you know, a national system, and I have a, the ability to send a message to the primary care doctor through a secure text message. And that is invaluable. I've used that many times, especially in these harder ones where you have a patient who is known to have bad cancer and then they're coming in with, you know, they, they're getting worse and you really need to, the primary care doctor who knows the patient to help you, whether they're coming in to talk to you, talk to the patient or just telling me, hey, this is what we discussed last time. I definitely take advantage of that resource a lot. That's what awesome. would you yeah, say? I, are... I love reading those when they come out. And uh, I always wish the patient, the patients always bring me some kind of handout about, you know, how to manage your BMI or like, this is what a heart attack is. <laughs> like, I don't want any of that stuff. <laughs> I want the discharge summary. Right. <laughs> That's uh, invaluable. Yeah. Are there ethical challenges in being a hospitalist or, or assistant program director? Yeah. I mean, I think there are ethical challenges. I mean, I tell people, um, you know, who are Catholic going into hospital medicine, you can't really hide behind and in any specialty, you know, that there are the issues related to the Catholic faith will come up in any specialty. I mean, I think the classic hot button ones that we talk about a lot, you know, um, don't come up as often in hospital medicine. I say the ethical issues I deal with more are the ones about end of life, um, you know, patients who are, uh, have advanced cancer need to make very difficult health decisions. Um, I deal a lot with ethical questions about who's the decision maker, you know, and someone that's gotten older and, and maybe the family's not available and how do you, the hospital, yeah. you know, it, are the needs of the hospital being balanced against the needs of the patient, right? How do you, if the patient needs resources, can you advocate for the patient to get those resources instead of saying like discharge, 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 get them out. Um, so right. trying, those I think are the things that I come into contact more frequently. Um, in my practice. What what type of uh, medical student do you think should consider a career in hospital medicine? Is that something for everybody or anything in particular that they should be thinking about? So I don't think it's for everybody. I think if you value long long-standing continuity with your patients, then you may not be happy in hospital medicine. I think that's the one thing this field doesn't offer. Um, I think the types of student who should consider hospital medicine are those who like something a little bit more fast paced, um, like doing a lot of different things, but maybe not doing the same thing every day. You know, like the idea that I don't necessarily know what my day is going to look like when I come into work can be fun. It can also be a little scary, but, um, you know, and obviously that's true in every specialty. You never know what's going to come up, but it certainly is true. Like I could come in at eight and my patient is crashing now. And I thought I was going to round for three hours, but I'm actually going to be running to a, an emergency, right? So I think being those who like flexibility, those who like different sorts of experiences all the time uh, might be happier in hospital medicine. And before we go to our break, maybe one question about VA work. Yeah. That's kind mm -hmm. of a whole subset in its own. Um, is there anything to consider for people who are looking at maybe a career with a VA? Yeah, I mean, for me, I never thought I would work at a VA. You know, that was, that's, but my training yeah. program had a VA um, associated with it. And my specific VA has such a phenomenal training environment. And someone who wanted to teach, it was a great place to teach. So most VAs, most VAs, people want to teach or people want to do research. At least that's my experience. Like at the VA hospitals, like they tend to maybe pay a little less, but they really do focus on, um, a teaching environment, a training environment. So they are attracting physicians who want to teach. And that's at least for the most part, I mean, that's obviously not true for everything, but the most part that's been my experience. Well, thank you, Paul. That rounds out the first half of this interview. We're gonna change to burnout in resident life when we come back here on Dr. Doctor after the break. Welcome back to the second half of our interview with uh, Dr. Paul Shanick. Paul, published an article in 2020 called The Spiritual Works of Mercy is a Tool to Prevent Burnout in Medical Trainees. I don't think anyone else in history has ever written such an article. <laughs> so, Paul, tell us about the state of burnout and stress in the lives of physicians and those who are in training who you deal with. Right. And so one of, I, one of my tasks as a, a program associate program director is I sit on the um, clinical competency committee. And so I hear about 
issues with residents. And what I remember hearing the most was issues with mental health. Um, I think burnout, I always thought of burnout as um, I've been doing this job for so long and I'm sick of it. And I realized that that's not exactly what our you know, learners are experiencing, right? The, the learners are, are, you maybe have a different idea of what being a physician was supposed to be like. And I'm sure both of you are aware that most of the time you are in the hospital working, you are not with the patient, right? Like there was a study right. that said, I think 12% of the time that you right. are in the hospital, you're seeing patients, the rest are on the phone or on the computer. Oh and- my gosh. And, and patients don't have a clue about that. That we're not just lollygagging, yeah. we're actually yeah. doing stuff for them. I haven't played golf in like ten years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play golf but, either. <laughs> that's that's no, what people people think. They're like, man, why has he only got you know a few minutes? But there is this whole body of work you got to accomplish. And so I think trainees are uniquely susceptible to that. You know, when you're in when you're learning, when you're you're trying to. Um, the, the job may not be what you wanted, but also it's physically difficult to be a learner. Like you both went through a residency and, um, you know, now there are things like work hour restrictions, but I mean, a typical <laughs> residence week may be like 80 hours a week, which is a lot. And they may be doing night shifts and day shifts. And, and so I think you have a, a person who's new, who's young, who is working an incredibly difficult schedule and maybe things aren't the way they thought it was going to be. And, and, and it's a, certainly a recipe for burnout, I think. What uh, what percentage of residents do you think experience burnout in their training? Yeah, this has been looked at. I think every, most fields w- have looked at the percentage of burnout in their trainees uh, and their learners. And so I think um, it has ranged from about 30 to 50 percent will experience one of the three um, signs of burnout, which are emotional exhaustion, um, depersonalization. And then the third is, I think, a, um, like a sense of loss of um you know, loss of making ability. a difference, yeah, right? Making a difference, right? That sort of. So, um, when you look at that definition, I think it's somewhere between thirty to fifty percent of learners have experienced this at some point in their training. And what do you think is the cause of that? Usually, is it uh, because of what you said? They it's different than what they expected. Is I mean, I it think the system? Is what is it? All of the above. I mean, I think it it can be the system. Um, you know, again, the you're not with patients yet. You're busier than you've ever been. I think it can also be the just the the physical exhaustion of that, and and you know, you're you're tired from doing the work. But I don't think it's necessarily that they're working too much. Because if that were the answer, I remember I think we I went to the burnout conference in 2019 uh, that the CMA put on with Dr. Parker. I remember him saying like the answer isn't don't work, right? The answer is like, can you find meaning at work? And I think that's something that they're really missing. They're really missing finding meaning at work. Like how can they make a difference to their patients? And I recently heard a podcast on this. um, And in this group, they thought it was not from the time. You're right. Time isn't related. It's they just didn't enjoy what they were doing. And they kept doing it over and over again, things that they didn't enjoy instead of the things that brought them the greatest joy or that they were best at. Could you relate to that at all? Yeah, I mean, that that fits my experience for sure, like as a resident. Like I, I definitely went through what I think some might call burnout. And, um, you know, it was a lot of that. It was, I have all of these tasks and I just cannot keep up with these tasks, but I'm not really right. good at these tasks. And this isn't like, I want to be a doctor. I want to take care of patients and teach. And um, all of these tasks are part of it, but I don't see the connection. And, and yet there's so many of them and they're not stopping, right? So I think it's the keeping up with the tasks that don't stop, and but it's not. So do you have less tasks as the head of a team than you did when you were in training? That's a good question. I, I don't think so. <laughs> I think I don't. I mean, I think it may be spread out a little further though, right? Like, so a resident may have 15 tasks in five hours that they need to get done. I may have 30 tasks over a day, right? And so it it may be, I feel like I still have plenty to do as an attending physician, but um, it doesn't feel always as urgent as like, oh my gosh, I got to get this okay. done immediately, right? And I think that definitely makes it feel better. There, there's something I think too about being able to see what's coming after you've done a job for a little while. I, I remember in residency feeling like, ah, I don't really know what I'm going to have to do next. Like not in so far as what patients are coming, but uh, what's my attending going to make me do? Yeah, our senior residents. Like, there's so much that's just 
out of your control. You're like, why am I here? Yeah, no, hundred percent. I I completely agree with that. Like you just don't know what might happen, right? You have less control. I think control also has been something that's been mentioned. Um, you know, residents don't feel like they have control or agency over what's going to happen in their day. Um, and you know, you mentioned the the depersonalization and, and that's something we've covered on this show. And I, I think it's a bit of a stereotype with uh, the medical profession in general, dark humor and things yeah. of that nature. How how can the spiritual works of mercy treat that in us as doctors? So I think that's, you know, I actually, like all good ideas, uh, I got the idea for this article in adoration. Uh, well, actually, I was, at, uh, I was at the CMA conference in uh, 2018, I think, when I thought about this. And, oh. uh, and um, the depersonalization for me, and actually I wrote about this in the article, really did remind me of what you know, St. Ignatius talked about when he talked about like spiritual desolation, right? Like, obviously, it's not a purely spiritual concept, but this idea that, you know, you're just in this rut. And like, I just love the the way that, um, you know, St. Ignatius, he talked about the, the it being like a darkness. I'm going to quote him because it's great. It said, the darkness of the soul, disturbance in it, movement to things low and earthly, and unquiet of different agitations and temptations, moving to want of confidence without hope, without love. You know, so this this to me is what I thought depersonalization. What it felt like this description I had heard of, of you know, spiritual desolation, and um, that's kind of I, th I think where the spiritual component can come in is if you are in a rut, it's harder to get out of that, right? <laughs> um, so, do you talk about this with residents as the spiritual works of mercy, or do you couch it in terms that they will better receive? I mean, that's what I, I do the latter, you know, I'm, I, um, mm -hmm. part of me wishes that I was a little more forthcoming with where that came from. But for me, I, I feel like I, I work with a lot of students who, you know, may not share my faith background and I want it to be right. applicable to them and understand it. And, um, there's sure. study upon study that says that spirit people with that, who practice spirituality have less burnout. There's a lot of studies about that, but what right. if my trainees don't like, how do I apply that to them? And that's something that I think so about. Number one, counseling the doubtful. How does that apply? Right. So, I mean, I think in terms of counseling the doubtful, you know, it's the idea of, you know, I don't know, right? Like being comfortable saying that I don't know is something hard for a trainee. And I don't ah. know if either of you experienced this, but I certainly did. And, and the idea of like being asked a question until you got one wrong, like, you know, you go around the room, do you know the answer to this? Do you know the answer to this? And, and it, while I've certainly done that, I think it can be done well and also not well. It certainly creates this environment where like, I better know the answer or else I'm going to get in big trouble. And I think if a train, if a learner guesses it wrong, that's got to be okay. And we need to model as faculty that it's okay to say, I don't know, right? Like, I don't know is part of my, I say that all the time at work because there's so much we don't know. <laughs> um, and I think that's, that's kind of where I think counseling the doubtful comes in. Instructing the ignorant. This one I felt bad writing because physicians and, and medical students are some of the <laughs> least ignorant people in terms of knowledge. But instruction, I think, is really important for a teaching physician to spend time on, right? Because I have student after student tell me, like, teach me, right? Te I'm here to learn. I'm paying to be here. Um, teach me. <laughs> and so I think we have to be thoughtful as teaching physicians that we're doing the work of teaching. Like the day that I described to you, teaching wasn't, there wasn't like a time. It's like, oh, I teach between like I eight and four, third. like I may give an occasional lecture here and there, but if I'm not intentional while I'm taking care of patients about teaching, right. And usually teaching at the bedside, you know, like um, we talked about this patient, this patient has anemia. What are the major causes of anemia, right? Like these are the, the ways that I tend to teach and the students have given me a lot of suggestions on how to do that better and more efficiently. But I think that's, it's not, and it's not just about teaching. It's about how you give that feedback to, you know, like the idea of um, the praise in public and, and correct in private, right? Like, so when we're instructing, yes. we want to instruct in a way that builds people up and not, not brings them down. What, uh, what role is there in instructing with the patients? Is there an opportunity there? You mean teaching with, like teaching the patient or teaching while the patient's present? Yeah. Teach, teach, do the patients uh, ask questions about this stuff sometimes? Absolutely. Right. And so I think oftentimes, I mean, I don't want, 
I don't want it to be where like I'm like holding court in front of a patient. They're sitting there looking up at me like, oh my goodness, they're talking about all these things, right? Like you, if, if I start teaching, usually I'll tell the patient, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be teaching now. Like, feel free to chime in if some, I said something wrong or if you have a different idea or you want to chime in too. And the patients often will say like, yeah, they do get short of breath with this condition. I feel short of breath all the time, right? And so the, the patient, as long as you invite them to participate, the patients will often participate. And I think there can be a temptation to do the former where it's like I'm holding court in front of a, the person I'm supposed to be taking care of and they feel really uncomfortable. They're like, what's happening? There's 10 people in the room talking about me, right? So, Very good. Number three, admonishing the sinner. Right. And so I mentioned this earlier, like a second ago, but this is really where it comes to that art of giving feedback, right? So like, obviously not sinning, right? But you know, our, our learners, we all make mistakes, right? But when you're a learner, when you're young, you're, it's just so much harder, right? So, and it's my job to hold them accountable, right? So for, if it's important to take care of this patient, I have to trust them that they're going to do it, right? If, you know, I told you the patient's potassium is high, you have to give them this medication to bring it down. What happens if they don't do it? What happens if they do it wrong? How do we take care of the patient, but also how do I give that feedback? And so it's that idea of, um, the splinter and the beam, right? The, in the, in the gospels, right? Yes. Like, like I make mistakes and I need to figure out a way to give feedback that acknowledges that I'm fallible also. And so it's, for me, it's really been the, the praise in public and correct in private. I think that's really the way that I've done this. How, how about comforting the sorrowful? <laughs> so again, this is a population that experiences a lot of burnout, right? And so, um, so while the residents are not always sorrowful, they're, they're going through a hard thing, right? They're working long hours. They, you know, healthcare is technocratic. I mentioned the 12% of time you're spending with the patients. And so they, there's, you know, the American Medical Association actually mentioned there's like five or six different things that we can do to support learners. And most of them are things that I have no control over. It's like, are they eating well? Are they exercising? You know, do, are they financially healthy? It's like, I can't do anything about that, right? But what I can do is I could like maybe bring lunch one week. Like I try to bring lunch one day a week, right? Or like maybe bring in breakfast every now and then. Um, or more realistically, more of what I'm, I do often is when we lose a patient or if something goes wrong, like how do we debrief? How do we acknowledge that um, something happened, right? And so that's something I, I take to heart a lot is when we, especially if we lose a patient unexpectedly, you know, for me, unfortunately, like I've seen this before, my trainees, this may be the first time they've experienced death, right? And as a Catholic, but also just as someone who cares about the trainee, you can't allow that to go without saying, hey, that was hard. Like, let's talk about those things and talk about what went into it. And and there is data that that can reduce burnout, but I think it's just the right thing to do as opposed to whether it's data-driven or not, right? Number five, forgiving injuries. Right. So when I was researching the article, I, I found about this saint who I just loved, and he became like one of my favorites. His name is St. Joseph Mascotti or St. Giuseppe Mascotti, and he's a, an Italian physician. Yes. And uh, he actually was a teaching physician uh, in internal medicine. Yep. And he actually talked about how to do this. And I, it, like he basically said that if the um, if there was a mistake happened, you know, he would kind of speak generally to the whole student body, and he wouldn't like single the person out that they made a mistake. And um, so he would sort of address the error that happened in a way that didn't hurt the person who made the error. And I mean, I'm sure you guys have, you know, uh, unfortunately, sure maybe you guys have never made a mistake, but I have <laughs> I'm in the hospital and I, I, I have made mistakes and, and the, the mistakes that you make sometimes hurt patients, right? And so the, um, the yes. idea that we need to talk about that openly and we need to admit that we are fallible people working in a flawed system and you know we have to report errors through like quality metrics and and we have ways to to keep our patients safe when errors occur but for me like when i talk to my trainees about an error it's about how do you learn from it what system factors were at play like were you i had this there was a story from years ago where I, there was this poor intern who forgot to sign an order that was really important he, he put the order in, it was for an antibiotic, it was really important, 
didn't do it, right? And when I talked to him, he said I had gotten like 15 pages, messages that were also important. I, I thought I did it. I just didn't click the button. And then I was distracted by all of these things. So like acknowledging that like that, yes, there are system factors at play, I think helps, you know, un learners learn that it's not just on them, right? There are systems that help keep patients safe. And, and here's something that I think faith gives to us, bearing wrongs patiently. That's something that's not always a secular virtue. No. Right? How do you teach that? No, it's not. And so this, um, you know, it, this is something that I think is really challenging, but at times like we need as, as a teaching physician, I need to own when my learner makes a mistake or if, you know, or just if something happened, like I, it's a team, right? It's a we, not you. And so if some, if a patient is angry at my intern, right, because of something the intern did, that has to become about me, right? Like I have to be able to step in and, and help the, the intern, like, and say like, no, we as a team made this, like also tell me about it, but also like being able to model difficult conversations, right? But believe it or not, sometimes there's conflicts in the hospital, right? And sometimes, um, what? You know, <laughs> yeah, sometimes, you know, a, a subspecialist may disagree on, on a case and um, there have been times where that can get heated, right? And so as the, I have to really do a good job of not shouting back, you know, if, the, if, if I'm not here to continue that cycle of, of anger and, and I, I don't do this perfectly, obviously, but this is something that I aspire to do is where I'm always trying to support my training. If they're being yelled at by a, a subspecialist or if they're yelling at something, we have to just have these conversations collegially and, and respectfully. Um, we have to forgive others. And I think St. Therese wrote about this where she talked about a sort of taking the fall for something that one of the other sisters did. I think it was, I wrote about, I, mm -hmm. I added it in the article where it was something like something got broken and she didn't break it, but she was sort of there and she got blamed for it. And she said, okay, that's, she kind of took ownership of the, the thing. And, and that's something I think about as St. Therese's example. It's, we don't necessarily need to defend ourselves all the time. Like we can just say like, okay, it happened. We have to, God will figure it out and we can, um, we, we don't have to fight about you know, who's right or who's wrong in this instance. All right. Last minute and a half. Number seven, praying for the living and the dead. Right. And so, I mean, I, I had a, a tradition of praying for my patients. Um, and when I became a chief resident, I was encouraged by a friend to um, pray for my residents, right? Because he said, hey, you don't have as many patients, but you do have residents. You should pray for them. And I really do try to do this. You know, it's something that we can do all the time is I have trainees. I can pray for them, right? This is a simple thing I can do um, yes. in the morning. And so for a Catholic physician, I, I thought this was a framework, the, these seven virtues, which are amazing virtues, um, ways that we can actually help our trainees. What, as, as we're wrapping up this interview, we really appreciate you being on. What kind of advice would you have for listeners who are patients when they're interacting with the hospitalist and the hospital team? Any advice for them? Yeah, I would say ask questions, like write down your questions you have, um, because someone will come back. Like if you think of something during a conversation and you're like, gosh, why didn't I ask the doctor? Write it down because someone's going to come back, right? Or you could ask to say, hey, I didn't get this question answered um, and speak up and advocate. I can't tell you how many times a patient or a family member pushed me because I said, hey, I think you've got this condition. And they said, but what about this? What about that? And it caused me to stop and think again. And then I would re-examine my thought of the diagnosis and I, it would really force me to listen. So I would say, ask questions, advocate for yourself. Don't be afraid of, you know, asking questions to the doctor because we really just want to know the answer. We want to help you. Paul Shanick, thank you so much for being with us on Dr. Doctor and enlightening us about something that most people don't know about the life of a hospitalist and an academic clinician. Thanks for being with us, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Appreciate it. And we are back with Dr. Doctor and the answer to the medical trivia question. Tom, great question. So back in 99, they predicted that we would need 19,000 hospitalists nationwide to fill every slot. So the question is, how many are there as of 2019, the last year I could find data? 
So 19,000 was the prediction. Was it less at 4,000 or 9,000? Was it right at 19? Or was it more at 29 or 44,000? The answer, 44,000. So they underestimated by over twofold how many we would need. And who knows how much has gone up since 2019? Yeah, I think this is something that has caught on and uh, it, it apparently is working so well that people just keep going in that direction. So I think there's there's more of that in our future for our medical and, system. And there's also, as I found out in my, when my dad was getting care, there are also hospitalist PAs and nurse practitioners. And so if you add that, there's even more. Yeah, it's a whole nother pathway that uh, patients, you know, don't interact with as much, hopefully. But when you do, you're sure happy you got them. So, Andrew, what are our top three takeaways for this show? I, I guess, uh, number one, I would say the hospitalist is somebody you've got to meet and learn to trust when you're in the hospital. And sometimes it can be hard because you just met them, but they're there, they're working for you, and they're going to take care of you. So I would say trust your hospitalist. Uh, number two, the spiritual works of mercy. Uh, they need no introduction, but <laughs> obviously a great a great antidote to many of the things that, that medical providers feel with burnout and depersonalization, but really all of us in daily life, I, I think it's an antidote for much of what ails the, the culture. And then number three, I liked his practical point for patients. Uh, if you find yourself or a loved one in the hospital, write down your questions. And uh, I think, Tom, you've, you've commented to that effect with patients you see, and I, I love it as well. It helps me know how to budget our time and oh, highlight absolutely. the most important. I, I had a patient that uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine, really nice guy. And we got done with all his, his stuff, making sure his preventive care is up and his, his uh, you know, we're changing his blood pressure medicine. And then I get up, you know, it's great to see you. We'll, we'll see you later. And he's like, well, you know, I just had one more question. T tell me about, you know, some of this data with the COVID vaccine and injuries and stuff. Like, what do you think about that? And he's like, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of, I, I want the protection, but I'm worried about the side effects. Just what, what are your thoughts? And I'm like, I already stood up. I'm like, <laughs> I, I would have budgeted my time differently. differently. So write down your questions. <laughs> yeah. And, and let, them, let us know ahead of time. And in fact, if you write them down, let the doctor look at them. He or she can then figure, okay, what's the best way to spend time here? Yeah. yeah. One of the things doctors dislike the most is a question when they thought they were done and have to get on to another patient. Uh, it, well, it's, it's a tough lose -lose. because you do, you know, on, on my side, you have some visits where the medical stuff is super straightforward, not changing much. We have the ability to really go deeply into things. Other times, it's a dumpster fire and you're like, I've got to just put out all these fires and you're just going to run the visit differently. So that's a great piece of advice, I think, for all medical interactions. And thank you all for listening to another episode of Dr. Doctor. You can find this and all our old episodes on our website, drdoctor.org. And you can click on episode archive at the top and search over 300 shows by topic or guest. And now, if you didn't know, we have a video version of our podcast. Just click on the YouTube link at the top of the drdoctor.org homepage. And if you have a question or a great idea for an episode topic, click where it says submit a question. This is Dr. Tom McGovern. And Dr. Andrew Mullally. And we're signing off until your next dose of Dr. Doctor.